episode two of the Colombo podcast with your hosts, Jerry and Ian. Hi guys. Ian, how are you doing? Not too bad. Second episode. Very exciting. Death lend, lends a hand. Yeah, we weren't cancelled after the first one, which is encouraging. The network seemed to like us. That's it. <laughs> um, so you've you've watched two episodes now. I have. So you're That's start- twice as much as I'd watched the last time. Yeah. Starting to get a, a sort of feel for, for the show, for the character. I would say no because of the differences between the two episodes. Okay. Uh, it was a different sort of performance from Colum- oh, from Peter Falk, even as Columbo in this episode, I felt. Mm-hmm. The way that he did the investigation was different, and the way that he interacted with other people, I felt, was a bit different. So it's hard to say, yeah, I'm getting a feel for it, because I don't know which of those two is the real Columbo, or if it's really going to end up being either or a combination. Well, I think, you know, the, the sort of second episode, the, the show itself probably doesn't, you know, isn't aware at that point what it's yeah. going to be. Um, I think that's fair to say. What is interesting is that this second episode uh, was actually the first episode filmed, but Murder by the Book, last week's episode, was shown prior to that. I can understand why they showed Murder by the Book first, because mm-hmm. for me it was a stronger episode. Yep. I'm not sure if that was actually the reason, if there was some other other reason, but I think it worked out probably worked out quite well. Yep. Um, so we have um, Robert Culp. We can chat about him later on, but he was a uh, he's the, the protagonist or, well, the, the, the guest killer this week. Yep, Brimmer. Brimmer. Uh, first of a number of appearances okay. in, in Colombo. You don't know that? But I don't know that yet, but well, I do now, obviously. Do. I'm sure a lot of people listening at home will be well aware of, of Robert Culp's presence in the show. You know, interesting. Perhaps in it, in fact, here's a question for anyone listening who wants to get in touch at Colombo Podcast on Twitter. Um, slightly, maybe a slight trick question. So don't jump right in there. How many times has Robert Culp uh, been involved with Columbo? How many times has he been on, been on a Columbo show? So that's a question. Perhaps not as obvious as what it first may seem but we'll leave it at that at Columbo Podcast on Twitter if anyone can be bothered if you're not on Twitter you can also reply again the show notes will be available on ColumboPodcast.com by the time you're listening to this you can reply to that and we'll engage with anybody who is brave enough to do so okay um, so yeah, interesting episode this week I think we uh, there are you know pills from me as a, a big fan I certainly enjoyed it anyway and again, but watching it through your eyes, I was more aware of perhaps some of the weaknesses or some of the issues which I hadn't really thought about before. So we can we can have a chat about that. It was sure. it certainly was interesting. Um, you know, you I think you'd said to me earlier today that you thought there were some morally morally dubious. I felt that there were a number of ethical questions <laughs> raised by the conduct of the police in this episode. I think I, I don't think so. I mean, I think perhaps by today's standards you wouldn't do certain things, but I, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that, but I think it was okay. It's a tricky one because not having been around in the 70s, I don't know what the moral and ethical standards were. So it's hard for me to say, yeah, that's fine because it was okay in those days because I, I don't know if that's necessarily right. Again, I don't know if it's wrong. Okay. Um, okay, let's let's crack on. Ian, can you provide us with a, a plot summary? I can. Um, after the fantastic reception last week's plot summary got on the podcast, I'll, I'll give it another go this week. This is a similarly simple setup to episode one. There's a death, an investigation, and a resolution. But the plot of Death Lends a Hand is a little more intricate than the one we saw in Murder by the Book. Essentially, you have an investigator called Brimmer, and I don't think we ever learn his first name, who blackmails the wife of a client, leading to an argument. He strikes her, she falls, hits her head, and dies. Columbo investigates the death, and Brimmer is hired to do the same on a private basis. This leads to some conflict between the two men, and a dramatic finale. Very good. Uh, Like last week's episode, we... And again, this may be a, something you've, you're starting to pick up on. We immediately begin the episode with with action. There's no... No op- theme tune. No theme tune, no opening credits. So we are in a gun range, pistol range. Pistol range, yeah. Yep. And we see uh, Brimner 
he is firing a number of shots into a target with a great deal of accuracy. Uh, he's giving orders to what seems to be his minions, his yeah, staff. It's not clear, or at least it wasn't clear to me at this point, exactly what he did, what job he had. Yep. I wasn't sure, is he a policeman? Is he... You know, it wasn't clear in the initial scene at the pistol range what this guy did. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know how commonplace it is or was to have a, a pistol range, a gun range in your your office. I mean, yeah, if you're a if you're a, if it's the police, then then fair enough. But uh, I I don't know. Would yeah, it, 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 I couldn't think of anybody else that it <laughs> yeah. might be. So that was okay. one that wasn't resolved immediately. So uh, Brimner walks through, or Brimmer walks through from the pistol range through the the offices, and he's. You know, he's giving orders. And I think, yeah, we get the impression this is an arrogant man. This is a man who believes he is superior to those well, he's well, speaking to. Well, yeah, he's the, quite obviously the boss. Um, and he expects people to listen and, and do what they're told. So, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and he walks through uh, yeah, different offices into uh, a main office where there is a, a secretary. Yes. And he sits at his... Uh, or we see on CCTV cameras... Uh, someone arriving at uh, at the complex. Yeah, I was quite interested in the use of the technology there because I didn't have a clear idea of what technology was available in 1971. So it was interesting to see that they had not only this CCTV system, but also later on we see the use of a car phone or at least some kind of mobile telephony device. Um, and that was interesting to me because I didn't, I didn't know what to expect there. Yeah, well, yeah, I was certainly impressed for, I mean, this episode was filmed in uh, 19, well, it was broadcast in 1971, so yeah, reasonably advanced technology, I would have thought for, or very advanced technology for, for the time. It would seem so. Okay, so we we see this person arriving on the CCTV cameras, um, and then we hear, or we hear Brimmer, he asks an unknown person to listen in to the forthcoming conversation. Yeah, initially I thought that was his secretary again, but it, it wasn't. No. Um, and then we see an older man arrive, who we are introduced to as a Mr. Kennicutt. Yes. And again, it's implied, or, or we learn that he has a, he seems to be some sort of media baron, he has a publishing business. Yes, and we, we also discover at this point that Brimmer is a private investigator. Yeah, that's made clear. I think he also calls himself, well, investigator and security. Something along think, those lines, yeah. if I remember rightly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we see this older chap arrive, um, and he's obviously very well off, uh, quite a powerful man himself. Uh, and we then go to the... Um, nah, well, actually, tell me what happens in this scene. Okay, so Brimmer presents a report to Kennicott where he tells him that his wife is not cheating on him, not having an affair, and Kennicutt is pleased by this, a bit embarrassed, I would imagine, feels guilty, says that he's going to shower his wife with gifts. Yeah. I mean, I think, I'd, I'm not too sure how, if he wholly believes the, the, the clean bill of health, it may well be that he's more relieved. He certainly was, perhaps I'm just being... Um, he certainly, he still thinks she was behaving strangely, mm -hmm. but he is pleased to be told that she wasn't having yeah. an affair. And I think it's one of those things that you want to believe, or you, you may feel he wanted to believe, so he maybe wouldn't challenge that too much. Yeah. Well, I mean, we learn that the wife's, you know, she's not, a, she's not in her twenties or thirties, but she's considerably younger than than Kenny Cut himself. Yes. Okay. Um. So, he leaves after being given this this good news that his wife is not or has not been having an affair. And we then go to a, a side office where this mystery person, mystery female, has been has been listening into the, the conversation. Yeah, she's heard the whole thing on Brimmer's instructions. Yep. And we discover that it is, in fact, the, the wife that they were... Lenore. Lenore Kinnicott, yes. Yes. Um, and we find out, or Brimmer states, that he is aware that she was, in fact, having an affair. Yes, so he's given a false report to his client. And he says that he didn't tell uh, Mr. Kennicutt uh, of the affair because, you know... He's a moralist, he yeah, says. Apparently, yeah. So for moral reasons, he didn't want to ruin a marriage you know, after one you know, one mistake, I think he says. Um, and she seems quite grateful. Yeah, the facade soon falls, doesn't it? He's not as 
good natured here as he makes out. No, as she's leaving, uh, I he suggests that in return for this favour, she, because of you know, obviously she'll be privy to certain information uh, that are, that you know the media. Yep, through mobile. her husband's sort of empire, she yeah. might be privy to information that is valuable to Bremer's investigations. And he asks her to pass this on. And and we maybe also suspect by the fact that he's blackmailing her that he might be interested in information he can use for blackmails as well in the future. Of Anything, course. Any leverage he might yeah. be able to ascertain or obtain. So he seems actually a fairly immoral chap. I think that's quite clear. Yeah. Um, but I mean, at this stage, he's not... He doesn't it doesn't threaten, you know, it's not a, a, an out-and-out blackmail. He tries to present it as, a, well, I've done you a favour, so it would be good if you could, you know, if you could reciprocate that, 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 that He that does, favor. he doesn't really press the consequence of not complying at this stage. He just presents the idea, and whether he assumes she'll go along with it, whether he's done this, whether he's done this before, Probably I safe. don't know. Well, I was going to say safe to assume he has, but, I mean, it depends how many clients with that much... Power that he we would, don't have enough information no, we, to really answer that, but he doesn't seem to be someone who's chancing his arm on this. He seems to have it set up in a way that hmm. he's comfortable. Yeah, of course. Um, but again, it's not a particular, it's not an out, an out and out threat because he asks her to to think about it. So, you know, he does, and, and perhaps that is because he feels it will work better if she's compliant, or mm-hmm. perhaps it's because he genuinely is prepared to let her walk away. I, I don't suspect so. Given the benefit of the doubt, why not? At this stage? Um, the next scene we are presented with uh, is in uh, Bremer's home. Yes. He, well, we see him driving home. and he, he We arrives. do. Yes. Some nice music, uh, which I enjoyed. Some 70s jazz. Uh, yep, I think it fit the scene quite nicely. It did. So we're in Bremer's home, and this is quite interesting, I thought. He arrives home, and Lenore, the wife, is sitting waiting for him on uh, on his return. Yes, it's almost like a role reversal, and it gives you the idea, well, maybe he's the victim here, maybe this is not going the way that you think <laughs> it was set up. But we quickly understand, or we quickly see that the the power has shifted. She, I think he's underestimated her and her reaction, because she's quite forthright, and she insists that uh, rather than give in to his blackmail requests, she is going to remove, you know, going to make him impotent effectively by telling her husband of the affair and telling, you know, coming clean. Yes. And that is information that would also then be uh, shared further. Obviously, the fact that Bremer had delivered a false report wasn't trustworthy. So she imagines that her husband, even though he'll be unhappy about the affair, will punish or at least present consequences for Bremer. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that at this stage it's interesting. He, on this revelation by the wife, and again, I think this is a, quite an interesting, you know, unusual. You would assume that the often the blackmailer is the victim, in in these situations where someone thinks it's the only way to to get out of the position Certainly they're in. The way that this scene began, I had that feeling because. I'd come into it thinking, oh, he's he's a bad guy, you know. Surely he's going to be the one here. But it, it flipped a wee bit and I was not as confident of that when we were mm-hmm. in the middle of this next scene. And, you know, the, the thing is that even at this stage, Brimmer is not necessarily uh, going to turn into a, a killer or a murderer. He's disappointed that she has decided not to go along with his devious plan. Uh, but there's no suggestion that he's going to do anything particularly, you know, uh, nasty to He does feel a bit it. angry, but he's not... No, he would be. Yes, but he's, he's not pulling out a knife or a gun or issuing threats or anything like that. Which is interesting because you would have assumed that if, if the wife, if Lenore tells her husband, he is going to obviously be aware that... Brimmer falsified the clean bill of health. Yes. So, I mean, we don't know what size of contract or potential contract. Uh, you would assume that a, me- a media, you know, baron or media mogul is always on the lookout for a, a good private eye who can provide them with salacious stories and gossip and, and, and news. Yes. So I would think he's probably quite a big client yeah, for Brimmer. Or potentially a big client. Yes. Um, so, I mean, he's going to lose that, that, that business for sure. 
Um, but, but yet, that still is not the uh, the trigger which you know causes the, the crime to be committed. No. What happens is that as she's leaving, she sort of twists the knife and does a and does a one more thing. She does, and it was amusing to see. It was almost exactly as you'd imagine. Colombo did it. You know, go for the door, stop, think, turn, speak. It was yeah, it was nice. And what she says is that not only is she going to admit to the affair. She is going to be quite detailed about the business practices of Brimmer and his company. Yeah, she's basically going to ruin him. Yeah. Now, this really does enrage him. Oh, he's furious. He is furious. Again, however, what I would say is that at this point, she's leaving uh, leaving the house at the door, and he tries to restrain her. And again, he says, no, think about this. Please, you know, don't do this. Have a, have a think about it. Yep. And she again, nice sort of portrayal of the of of the of the, the female here. She's not just a, she's not a victim as such in the sense that she's going to just give whatever or take whatever she's given. She fights back. She says, "No, I'm 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 doing this." And she she, there is a struggle. He loses his temper, and he slaps her uh, with a backhand across the face. She falls back, and. Hits her head on a glass table as she falls. Yep. Table shatters. She's clearly dead. Does did the scene did that 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 scene remind you of anything? Yes, because in the first show, Murder by the Book, we saw the second murder of Lily Lasanka mm-hmm. and the silent scream, and they used that silence technique. They did a bit with silence in the opening scene on the pistol range, which was interesting. But then they do it much more specifically, or the attacks in slow motion. Yeah. Uh, we've got a focus on the faces, mm-hmm. so we see the emotions. You know, we see the anger and the rage in the face of Brimmer, and we see almost like shock on the face of uh, Kennicott because it, she's not expecting yeah. to be struck. I mean, it's a powerful technique, and I'm not sure if it was used solely for the purpose of showing, you know, for, for being powerful, or if it may have something to do with. Uh, if it was more graphic, it would not be allowed to be broadcast perhaps earlier That's in, in the day. So it's sure. a way of getting around that, perhaps. But I, I like it. I mean, I think it's a, it's a powerful... It's effective. You can't argue that. I, yeah. I think if they did it every single week, it might start to grate a little bit. But mm. through the first two episodes, I'm more than happy with the way that they've used that. So, in my mind, I mean, this isn't, you know... It's interesting. It's not a murder. I might not agree with you there. Yeah... See, I'm not sure. It was, there was. I, I don't know what the, uh, the what the, the judicial judicial system in the states in, in the seventies would have made of this, but I think just now, and again, you have a, a legal background, yeah. although not criminal, but you still have a. Oh, I studied criminal law at university oh, okay. as part of my degree. <laughs> now, I would say the question here is whether, if it was a case under Scots law, mm-hmm. the question would be whether Brimmer was criminally negligent. Mm. You know, did he have sufficient reckless disregard? for her well-being, that he took an action that could result in her death, that foreseeably could result in her death. Uh, I think there's an argument to be made there. He's committed a crime, one way or another. Whether it's murder or not, I think it's arguable, but I think you can make that case. Uh, I think a decent lawyer might be able to reduce the the sentence. Now, I mean, there are a number of cases where what happens is there's a, a pub fight, someone has a scrap after having too much to drink, they punch a person with no huge intent to cause damage, but they fall down, and there there has been several high-profile cases. Now, in in those situations, what generally happens? Would it not be manslaughter we would would have in the UK? I think it would really depend on the facts and the circumstances. The question is usually going to come down to the foreseeability. Did you do something that the average or reasonable person would foresee might cause this consequence? So, you know, if you punch someone in the face and they just die inexplicably, you know, from whatever reason if they had a heart condition or if there's a blood clot involved, whatever reason then it's difficult to argue that that was foreseeable. If you punch someone with a glass table behind them and they fall and the death's caused by the glass table that's maybe something that you could argue you ought to have been aware of. It's your house, you know what's in your house. Sure. It's not, well in Brimmer's case anyway I think that there's a case to be made that he was sufficiently negligent that this could be classed as a or murder. Okay. And I would imagine with it being American classification second degree murder. Uh, but 
like I say, my qualifications from a slightly different jurisdiction, so it's <laughs> only uh, partially um, useful. Okay. We then have another interesting uh, piece of direction. It's, it's, it's odd. Yes. The, the word I wrote was weird. A bit weird, mm -hmm. is what I said. What happens? They zoom in to the face of Brimmer and freeze on a big close-up of his eyes and nose. He's wearing glasses. And in each lens of the glasses, we see a separate view of the post-death scene. The clean, Essentially, the, the, the clean-up clean up and the uh, actions that Brimmer takes to cover his tracks. He makes it. He, he removes possessions to make it look like a, a robbery. Well, it appears that's what he's doing. He takes yeah. a ring from her finger, he takes cash from her purse, and then he wipes fingerprints mm -hmm. off of everything that he can find. You know my feeling on this. I believe that this is a technique that they have perhaps just recently discovered and they're doing it because they can. Now, that's not to say that I don't like it. I don't like it. Okay. Uh, I think it's okay. You, uh, but I, I, I think it's a technique probably, you know, they're, they're showing off. And, I thought it was uh, really difficult to follow both uh, lenses at once. I thought it wasn't clear what the difference between the two lenses was. I thought it took me out of the story. You know, it, it took me to a point where I was saying, oh, look at this directorial technique, look what we can do with the camera, mm -hmm. rather than advancing the plot mm -hmm. uh, and keeping me in the moment. We've just had a, a sort of a mini climax, you know, the the primary climax at the start of the episode yeah. is this death. And then we're kind of taken out of it with this technique in the shot, which I don't think works. Okay. Well, I mean, the director was a, a chap called Bernard L. Kowalski. We'll blame him then. We should blame him. I don't know much about him, but I mean, he is fairly prolific in terms of TV shows that you will be aware of. Airwolf, Knight Rider, Diagnosis Murder, Banachek, Beretta, and in fact, four other episodes of, or four in total episodes of, of Columbo. Including this one. Including this one. Okay. So you may, maybe in the future we'll... we'll... It could be that this is something that he learns from and it leads to developments of other techniques in the future. Mm. I don't know. But Maybe. I'm just saying for this episode in this moment, for me, it didn't work. And that isn't saying he should be doing something that couldn't be done in 71. It's saying that he didn't need to mm -hmm. do anything like that. He could have done this in a different way. And I felt this was not the right choice. Just to quickly step back to the whether or not it was would, would be regarded as murder. Does it make any difference? Do you think that she has in fact... Now this... Ah. She has broken into his house. She came to him, uninvited, and broke into his house. Could ah? Could there be a? This is a tricky one a because case again, of, of, oh, well, I think, and again, we're putting up the caveat. This is not my jurisdiction. My understanding is that there are parts of America, at least, where there are much more conservative, shall we say, rules and laws in regards to the protection of your own home. Yeah. So you are entitled to do anything you more. want. More, I'm not going to say anything you want. I don't think it's the same from state to state. But certainly, that there is more leeway offered to homeowners when there's an intruder. So that is a possibility. We don't, as you said last week on the podcast, we don't get into the trial and the mitigation no. and the rest of that side of things. We get at the investigation by Colombo, and we should say it doesn't matter whether it's a murder or not. Colombo is not. A murder investigator, no. so to speak. He's a policeman investigating a crime. Okay. And it certainly is a crime. We'll leave it there and perhaps we can ask if there, if there is anyone who was a lawyer or in the police force in the 1970s in California, please get in touch. At sure, but podcast. Do not check through outstanding warrants before you do, if that's okay. No, just sing that for a friend. Okay. Okay. Um, what happens next is we see Brimmer in his car. He's moving the body. He, yes, this nice, is a again, strange one. Nice music. I enjoyed mm -hmm. the the seventies. Uh, really enjoyed the seventies sort of jazz feel to it. Just while we're talking about that, the the Henry Mancini or Mancini, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Um, he is credited with the theme, but not the score, which is interesting. I'm not really sure because obviously Columbo doesn't have a have a theme, but I'm thinking it must be uh, just the overarching um, the theme of the episode. Theme maybe. of the episode, yeah. Um, but yeah, I like that. Yeah, this is an interesting one for me because Brimmer has just been meticulous. He's used his knuckles to remove money from a purse. Mm -hmm. He's wiped fingerprints off everything, and then he drives up 
dumps the body and drives off with tyre tracks from his own personal car leading right to the body and right away from it. Now, it could be that tyre tracks weren't something that got investigated in the 1970s. Oh, that no, seems I, unlikely to me. I think I think they were. Because that was my first, uh, when I first well, watched that again recently, uh, you know, that's the first obvious It's quite clear. Obvious clue. You can pick them up even on, you know, whatever definition the, the episode was shot in. It, it certainly wasn't 4K or whatever we <laughs> use nowadays. But you can still see quite clearly tyre tracks yep. leading up, body line there, tyre tracks leading away. And it seemed to me that's going to be pivotal here. Yep. And it's very careless from someone who's been so meticulous up to that point. And I think this is an interesting departure from the previous episode where we had a planned murder. Something that was, although it wasn't done very well by that character, by Ken Franklin, he had a plan and he yep. was executing a plan. This episode wasn't even a guy intending to kill somebody. No. He's accidentally killed somebody and now he is trying to use his training and his instincts to get away with that crime. So, so in fact, if it, if and when it goes to uh, the, to court, this uh, could actually be used in his defence, his lack of uh, premeditation. It really depends what approach he takes. Uh, yeah, possibly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so... We then are introduced to Columbo for the first time in this episode. We are, and it's a very different introduction to the one we got to him last time. Mm-hmm. It's more light-hearted. It's a strange one again, and this is the first of my ethical questions this week. <laughs> because he gets stopped by a policeman for having a broken indicator, as we would call it. I don't think that was the term they used. They used... Um, I can't remember the term they used in the episode. It wasn't indicator. Tail light. Like we would call it. No, it wasn't his tail light. It was oh, the blinker or blinker, something like yeah. that. But he hasn't fixed it. He knew it was broken. <clears throat> he is entitled to receive some form of penalty. But on indicating to the officer that he too is a policeman, he is not only let off with the violation, shall we say, but he is escorted to his next spot. I'm not sure, to be honest, if that wouldn't or doesn't happen today. I still think that would happen. I if, still uh, think it's ethically dubious. Perhaps. But I, I reckon if a traffic traffic cop pulls over a, a superior, he probably won't uh, 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 he probably wouldn't give him the give him the ticket. It's not a big deal. Does it bother you? It doesn't bother me. It just it, it's more interesting because it's the first of I think four ethically questionable moments in this okay. episode. Uh it, it perhaps is the least questionable of the four. But it's it's there and um, it's something that occurred to me while I was watching it. This scene is also important because uh, we also find out that his Columbo's driving license is due to expire shortly. Yes, and, that and becomes more important. on that later. More on that later. <laughs> uh, so we get get to the the construction yard where the the body was was dumped, and yes. Columbo is going through, you know, his. Well, he, he, he seems a bit disinterested. He's not paying a great deal of attention. He, he's more interested in, in finding a match for his cigar. Yeah. You mentioned that you think in this case his colleagues are actually doing a pretty decent job. They're being yeah, this is a, a contrast to last week where we pointed out the whole incompetent police trope. Mm-hmm. This week, other than handling evidence and putting their mucky fingerprints all over it, the police behave in a fairly competent way, I would say, or at least that was the impression I got from this scene. I didn't see anything that I questioned significantly, so I was pleased by that. Columbo, the only real point he makes is to understand that, uh, or accept, notice that there has been a a cut, a mark on the the cheekbone of the victim. He doesn't say that. He looks at her face. Well, it's mentioned by the police. And he then then looks at the body and says, and they're like, you weren't listening to us when Mm -hmm. we said this? Um, Another interesting... uh, remark is the cops obviously are aware of, well, they say they're, they're aware of who the victim's husband is, and they make comment that if they don't do a good job, it could be bad publicity for them. Yes. That's interesting, because Columbo quite obviously doesn't really care about that. No. For how, a certain scene later, uh, shortly, where he doesn't act massively uh, convincingly no. professionally. Yeah, I think, if we go back for a second also to the not listening thing, it's interesting to think about. He looks only at her face. If he didn't know she'd been hit in the face, why would he look only at her face? Mm-hmm. 
So perhaps he was listening and it was just his usual, oh, I'm so daft, you know, don't mind me. Again, maybe a sign of the times or just the style of the show. There's no other mention of these days you would ask for any other type of assault. Uh, nothing, you know, not a mention, no question. No. But perhaps it's just uh, more innocent times or just... Um, uh, not, not or sure. what techniques were available, we don't yeah. know. Yeah. Okay. Um, where do we go from there? It's the Morgor Hospital. It wasn't clear to me which it was, but certainly there's a body being identified. Mm-hmm. And we... Ken, uh, Kennicott? Mr. Arthur Kennicott. Uh, Arthur there, yes. Kennicott's there. And he identifies the, the body. Colombo's also there. He is. Nice performance by... Uh, by Ray Milland. Yes, a well-known name, I would imagine, at that time. Yeah, I mean, I found this interesting, that, you know, that, that Ray Milland was actually, you know, he was a guest star, but not the primary guest star. He took a sort of second uh, s- s- second stage to Robert Culp. I mean, Milland was a massive star. He, perhaps his star was on the wane, you know, sometimes they... they what happens is with these stars is they have their peak and it's on the wane for a few decades, then they have a, a renaissance uh, later in their in their career and their life. But, um, I mean, Milan is obviously famous for Dial M for Murder. Um, he had his own television show, The Ray Milan Show. He also won an Oscar, didn't he? He won in 1946. I'm not, I've not actually seen the film, but The Lost Weekend. But, by all accounts, fantastic performance. It's not in my collection, but if he won the Oscar, it must have been... Yep. One of the best. Should have been. He died in 1986, aged 81. Um, but like I say, yeah, interesting that he would accept that sort of minor part or a smaller role. I think it's interesting because it's only recently that being on television has taken equal status to being in the movies. So if he was a movie star yep. and now he's appearing in television, that might well have been something that was seen as a step down. So having made uh, a step well, down, maybe he would be... But that, that's interesting. Uh, I said that he, did, he had his own television show. Apparently he was one of the first stars to actually, from you know one of the A-list stars of the movies, to embrace TV uh, uh, with, his own, with his own show. That's so, very interesting. Yeah. I mean, it would be something that's worth spending a bit of time looking into and, and mm-hmm. learning more. And if anyone wants to do that, there will be links in the show notes on columbopodcast.com. Yeah. Uh, while we're talking about the actors, probably worth mentioning Robert Culp who plays Brimmer. Yeah, we talked about him briefly at the outset. Yeah, again, another prolific TV actor, probably best known for teaming up with uh, Bill Cosby, who we won't discuss just now, uh, on I Spy. Uh, And more laterally, Everybody Loves Raymond. That's a popular recent show. It is. I must admit, not haven't really watched either of those shows, and I I, I know know, mainly from from Columbo, but I I am aware of how how big a star uh, he actually was married five times, played poker with Hugh Hefner fairly frequently. Not sure if that's in any way related to his five marriages. Who can say? Four wives, probably one of those. They'll all have an opinion, I'm sure. Yep. Uh, Robert Culp sadly died in 2010, age 79. Not too many of this uh, particular episode still with us. No, not too many, but it was a long time ago. It was, it was. Uh, okay, so we were in the hospital, or the morgue. Yeah, the body's been identified, and Kennicott and Colombo are having their first real conversation. Nice performance by Milan, I thought. You know, he comes across as um, saddened, upset. You can as buy you this expect. character as authentic, absolutely. There's yeah. no difficulty with that. He doesn't come across as in any way... He's, I am acting right now. No. You know, the way you sometimes get with these people, it, not these, when I say these people, <laughs> actors. actors. <laughs> uh, he comes across very well. I think he presents the character in a realistic way, in a believable way, and does a good job, certainly. He does. Uh, he acknowledges the fact that, as her husband, he is probably the, the prime suspect, and he offers some uh, alibi. He was, yes, elsewhere at a conference. Yeah. Colombo seems to accept us, you know, fairly, fairly easily. Yeah, this is one of my issues with this episode. Colombo seems to have a fairly fixed idea of what's happened from far earlier at stage than you could realistically expect him to have enough information to base that on. Well, in fact, it's in this particular, this actual scene, this is where we start to see that Colombo is forming a, a, a very accurate picture yeah, of, a, of what a, happened. a supernaturally accurate picture, based, straight away. Based on nothing, really. 
That's he it. focuses on an affair, a potential affair. Yes. I don't know what that is, other than the age gap. There's really nothing to base that on. Nope. I don't. I did nothing that was obvious to me. Yeah, and I think he keeps questioning, you know, Mister Arthur Kennicott about this, and uh, Kennicott again says, "Listen, clean bill of health. You're going down the wrong, you know, wrong avenue here." Uh, and he is very self-deprecating, Columbo as usual, and says, "Okay, so you, you don't think I should, you know, you don't think I should, you know, focus on this uh, th- this particular yeah. uh, line of inquiry." Of course, he, he does anyway. But again, he always, you know, looks to be a quite um, what's the word I'm looking for? Agreeable. 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 Um, you, you have to question, and I was certainly questioning why, you know, why would you rule out robbery at this point? You know, it's the most obvious, you know, <laughs> it's meant to look like a robbery. Yeah, it's just <clears> one of many things that I questioned in the, the approach that Columbo took, not just at this scene, but basically throughout the episode. It felt awfully like he had, much like some of the other characters we've seen in the last two weeks, he has created a narrative, and now rather than trying to convince people of the narrative, he's trying to prove the narrative. I, mean, I think in future episodes there is generally, you know, something... A far stronger clue, something that stands out to make you know to d- divert you or d- divert him from the yeah the, the killer's narrative. Uh, in this case, it's not quite there yet. It's more of a hunch or a suspicion. There's nothing really to hang it on. Now, this is interesting because, as we said, this is in fact the uh, the first episode which was produced. Yeah, and in this case, the writing was done by the creators. Um, Lincoln Levison. Lincoln Levison, with Stephen Botchko, the award-winning writer. He was a a story editor, right? So it may well be that you know he's you know as they develop, they get other guys in to to write who are who have more of a you know are, are better at putting these up. I think Lincoln Levison are great at putting a general theme or a story together, but perhaps not the the, the greatest at the the, the details. Yeah, and I think this case, that this particular episode, lacks some details. It rel- relies too much on yeah, on nothing. I mean, for me, Columbo is a great investigator, like we saw last week, and and even then there was some guesswork and so on going on. But Columbo is a great investigator. Is a better character than Columbo as a psychic who just knows what happened. That yeah. that doesn't work for me as no. a basis for a series. So we. Columbo leaves the uh, the hospital and he's thanked by Kennicott for the nasty hospital coffee and I think you know I think that just shows that he's a Kennicott's actually quite a decent guy. You would expect the uh, the traditional you know media mogul baron to be pretty nasty pieces of work, but I think in this case uh, Kennicott seems like a a reasonable chap. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't have any kind of healthy disregard for the police. No, firm but fair, you might say. Perhaps. Um, so the next scene is in the garden of Kennicott's home. And we're not sure how how, lo- how long has lapsed. We're not, but I got the feeling it must be some significant amount of time. Well, it must be. Firstly, I should say that it looks beautiful. The it's scenery, the pools. Well, yeah. yeah, I wonder where that was filmed. Maybe try and find out. But it's a lovely garden. Beautiful in the blue sky. Uh, very impressive. Um, but Colombo immediately, you know, he's talking about the murderer and um, you know, so he's you know, he's definitely got this uh, bee in his bonnet, he knows it wasn't a, I'm not sure how but he knows it wasn't a, just a, a robbery mm-hmm. gone wrong uh, and he says he knows this because Lenore went to the beach house, spoke to, I think it was a maid and said that she had to think about things she went for a, a walk on the beach and then was found across town in the um, The construction construction yard. yard. Um, But again, you know, you have to... Yeah, well, I suppose that is probably... That's probably fair enough. If it was a robbery, you would leave the body. I think you can understand Colombo being sceptical about it being a robbery, and perhaps there are other officers working up that, you know, less realistic line of inquiry. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, you can make a plausible yeah. I mean, basis Ken- for that. Talking about the talking about the the, the, the time lapse, Kennicott informs Columbo that he's not happy with the progress that's been made. 
Yes, because Columbus <clears throat> saying we've still got no leads, nothing's happening. So I'm assuming that it's not, you know, the next day. Yeah, it must be days later, at least. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that Colombo is nudging again, saying, you know, are you sure there wasn't an affair? He wants to investigate that. As if Kenny Cut saying don't investigate that was enough for him not to investigate it, which I suspect is not right. Probably not how you would how it would pan so out. So whether this is Colombo genuinely looking for approval or whether it's just him dictating the terms of his relationship with Kenny Cut at this mm -hmm. stage, he's trying to create a collaborative sort of cooperative approach maybe and he's couching his language and mm -hmm. his behaviour in that yeah. frame of reference. We move inside to Kennicott's home and we're in or Columbo is introduced to Brimmer. Brimmer's there, yes. Brimmer is there. And what happens is we are informed that Brimmer has offered his services to Kennicott. Yeah, to I help. think it's quite important that we understand that Brimmer called Kennicott. Yes. Asking to be brought in on this investigation. Now, that is typical of Bill. You know, what we have here is someone with a bit of ego who believes they are, you know, superior, can't be, won't be caught, and also wants to be able to direct. Possibly, or he fears he will be caught and wants to be in a position to direct the investigation or be aware of the investigation. Okay. So it could be one of either. Or both. Yeah, but I suspect it's a massive mistake. <laughs> I would say so. Um, and Brimmer uh, also quite quickly tries to put or Columbo in his in his place by mentioning that he was speaking to the police commissioner the previous night. I think name dropping, yeah. Name dropping is if to say, listen, you know, I'm above your pay grade here. You know, so what? You know, we, this is how the relationship's going to work. Um, so yeah, we find out that Kennicott has. Employed, or we also find out that Brimmer, on a private for a private job, had been employed by uh, Kennicott recently. Yes. So that's a f maybe a first. Yeah, we don't get the full story on that, but we, we don't. know that there's a relationship there. There is a relationship there. Um, now, Kennicott says, "Yeah, Brimmer will be working. You don't have any objections." And Columbo at first appears quite puzzled, but as per usual, he then. Uh, it's quite self-deprecating and says, no, no, yeah, I'm quite happy to take all the It's all, a line they used the, the previous week, I'll take all, all the, the help. help I can get. Yeah. Uh, then there is a very, very strange, yeah, an extremely yeah. strange yeah, scene that we have. Or If it wasn't so vital to the plot, or at least if it wasn't referred to later by Columbo, I'd almost say, let's just pretend this didn't happen. Yeah, well, that's the thing, I don't actually, I don't think this isn't, I don't think this is vital at all, but what happens is, Columbo, the, Columbo says that he is into all sorts of mysticism, tarot cards, and, and palmistry. Yes. And he, this is in order to feel the palms of both Kennicott and Brimmer to identify or determine whether or not they're wearing a ring that may have matched or may match the the ring that would have caused the uh, the cut yes. on Lenore. Now, I've, I do have a number of issues with this. Um, the first is obvious that there's easier ways to do that. Yeah, you could simply notice the um, the ring and, and and ask to see it. Um, or you can see, you, know, you can just look. I don't know. Going back to the original scene with the cops, and they said that uh, if they get it wrong or they mess up, this could be embarrassing or could be bad news because Kennicott can, you know, give you give, give the cops some bad PR. Columbo ignores this by this sort of buffoonery and nonsense about palm reading and and looking like a fool. To be perfectly honest, I'm yeah. not sure if it's the approach I would have taken. I think it's a weird one, and I didn't. Again, similar to what we talked about earlier with the unusual direction, this is something I felt didn't sit quite right. No, no. It didn't fit with what I understood of the character from the previous week, mm -hmm. or from this week to that point, or my preconceptions, yeah. such as they were. Okay. But he obviously identifies that Brimmer is wearing a, a ring, an appropriate ring. Why would he even have an interest in Brimmer at this stage? Well, I mean, I suppose if you're... 
if, if you suspect that she has been murdered as opposed to a robbery, it's going to be someone... Possibly. And I suppose uh, possibly, uh, uh, if he's not ruled out Kennicott, yes. he is covering his tracks in a sense yeah. by looking at Brimmer as well. Sure. But then they just both think it's weird rather than one of them thinking it's weird. So I don't know that that achieves anything. Mm-hmm. A uh, more light-hearted uh, exit to this scene. Columbo... But see, it's interesting because what, he stumbles into a closet as he, and instead of the, 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 the door to exit the, the yeah. room. Uh, and... Uh, whilst it's quite funny, uh, it's also quite lucky as well because he discovers a set of golf clubs. Yes. And because of that discovery, we then he then finds out that Lenore uh, took golf lessons and was a keen golfer. Which, yes. be, which obviously becomes important. It does. Now, this must just be a, a massive amount of luck because of. Sure, no- there's, well, other than the fact that Columbo is showing off his psychic ability at other times in the episode, it, yeah, there's no way that he could know. But in First, that, that this is a closet because the doors are yeah. identical. And secondly, what's going to be in the closet? No, I, I'm not buying that this is a deliberate move oh. by Columbo at all. I quite like that little scene. It's quite fun. Yeah. Quite charming. Um, and as he's leaving Kennicott's house, we see him noticing something odd about Brimmer's car. We don't know what it is, but he, he spends about a, a few seconds looking. My assumption, going back to what we <laughs> said before, was it's the tyres. He's yeah. recognised the track, that, that would the be the, yeah. the tyres. Yeah. But no, it but no. wasn't that. So, based on his findings uh, with regards to the golf clubs, we next see him at the country club or golf course golf Club. Yes, we don't we don't see Columbo straight away. We go to the country club and Ken Archer is the name we later find out is a tutor. Okay, and the, he's the golf on pro. the putting green with a young lady. Yes, and he seems a bit of a a bit of a ladies' man, a bit of a charmer. Yes, we get the impression that she is used to a bit of bonus time, so to speak, with this tutor. <laughs> yeah, um, and what we see Columbo uh, going through the the guest book. Yeah, the appointment the appointment book yes. in the in the shop. And uh, the pro, he he comes back off the off the green, and Columbo's looking at the uh, the appointment book, and in comes the pro, asks him what he's doing. Uh, Columbo identifies himself as a cop, and asks if he was aware of Lenore. Yes, he acts a bit suspicious. Said he hardly knew her. Uh, Columbo, because he would looked at the appointments book, says, "Well, not according to this book." Um, he then asks if. Lenore, what, what was it he said, um, was on the lookout. Yes, I, I have no idea what he meant by no that. No idea what that, but uh, the pro says, listen, I just teach them golf. Uh, Columbo observes that all of her lessons were the last one of the day. Yes, with, with him. Uh, and he, Columbo actually asks if he can uh, go on the... No, does he actually... Does, before he goes out for a... A lesson. A lesson. Does he mention? He says to the uh, the pro, "Listen, I'm not going to talk to you anymore about this. You need to get yourself a lawyer." I think that's when they're on their way out. So I think okay. he asks for a lesson, and as they're walking to the tea. Yeah. Now we disagree on this. We won't spend too much time on it. But yeah, I think Colombo was using scare tactics and was playing mind games with someone who he knew would, you know, was not you know was not an egomaniac, a normal sort of person, and would be quite scared with the whole talk of lawyers and thinking that he was in trouble. Yeah, I think Columbo was just trying to stop the guy from saying something stupid. Okay, disagree on that, but yeah. hey. Um, so Columbo goes out, takes his takes his jacket off, and what happens is he... Well, what happens? Well, he takes a golf swing. He says he, he hasn't played golf for a long time. He used to be good. Yeah. He doesn't have time to be good anymore. And... And then he knocks a perfect drive 250 yards down the middle of the fairway. And then says, listen, let's forget about the lesson. I'm off. Yes. And for me, this is almost like a metaphor for his detective work. You get the impression he's going to be terrible. Yeah. Turns out he's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that is true. But the fact that he didn't ask any questions... Uh, here's the thing. Here's why you're wrong. If that was the case, he wouldn't have come back in the future to discuss with the golf pro, but he didn't have a lawyer. So what he's done here is he's, he's scared them, he's, he's made them think, he's made them get worried about this whole thing, so that he's softened them up, so that in the future he can come back and get more information. If he was worried about him speaking out of turn without representation, he wouldn't have come back. 
perhaps. Yeah. You could be right. I think I am. Um, so we progressed with the, the investigation and we're in uh, Brimmer's uh, a meeting room within his office and he's debriefing his staff on uh, what he thinks, his theory, his faked theory of what happens with regards to an abduction and a, and a, and a robbery gone, gone wrong. Yeah? yeah, he's given them very clear instructions. This is the theory they are to proceed on the basis of. Go out and get proof. Okay. Uh, we then see him in his own office and Colombo brings along the, the case notes apparently compelled by by him or his or, or, the, or the, the police the department anyway, yeah. yes. I'm not even sure again this is one of the things I don't know what the, the standards were or what the rules or guidelines were in 1970s California but that seems odd that you know, any any third party private agency would be allowed to easily act especially when these guys still must be as far as Columbo's superiors would be concerned you know until there's some sort of conclusion they must all be treated potentially as, as suspects you can't go handing over uh, police notes no but it, then we don't know what's in the folder that he hands over. It may well be nothing of value. Yeah. Um, Colombo, you know, again, his you know, a, a tactic of his. He mentions the the cut on the cheek. He pauses. He creates some tension uh, before telling Brimmer, Brimmer about the theory of the the backhanded slap and the of a left-handed chap and yes. the ring. Yes, forcing Brimmer. To admit that he has a, a ring, yes, that, you know, of uh, similar uh, stature. Yeah, Brimmer gets irritated by the questions that Columbo goes with here, but I don't think he fully grasps what Columbo is getting at. No. I don't think he understands that he is having a finger pointed at him here, and understandably, because there's no reason for Columbo to suspect Brimmer at this point. But he he seems to be concluded he's committed the crime already. Well, not just that. Exactly how it was committed, or you know, he, Columbo actually says that uh, it was pr- it could possibly have been uh, a mistake. Yes. So that it, it was someone lost control. Yeah, he, he's he solved it with nothing to go on, more or less. Nothing at all. But he doesn't give Brimmer enough, obviously, at this point, for Brimmer to cotton on because he's made this whole point of the killer being left-handed. Yeah. He then gets Brimmer to write something down and he writes with his left hand Mm -hmm. and fair enough if Brimmer's left handed that's fine. Brimmer makes a big show saying oh I'm not left handed I'm ambidextrous but being ambidextrous knowing that Columbo is looking and pointing the finger at him for being left handed he would just have written with his right hand surely Mm -hmm. and made out he was right handed. I think it's just yeah that that, yeah that's (laughs) But Brimmer's obviously not thinking about that. Yeah, I, I don't think Brimmer's caught on, and we'll see later in the episode that Columbo literally has to abandon all subtlety completely <laughs> to actually get a message through to Brimmer. Yeah. On that side of things. Okay. Um, Columbo puts Brimmer on the back foot by stating Sherlock Holmesian like that he has a he lives at or has a home at the beach. Yes. And Brimmer says, well, "How do you know that?" And we are. Well, Columbo says it's because he looked. He saw his car. There was some sort of uh, sea air, sea salt damage. Yeah, that, damage to the chrome. Yeah, I'm not sure how common that is. I don't live at the beach, unfortunately. Well, I'm from the beach, and you're not from the same type of beach. Ian. You're you're from different. Air. Yes. Anyone wants to check out Air Beach compared to you know Venice Beach, but they're free to do so. It's not a. Pl- it's not. It's not a nice comparison. No. No. But you do see a lot of rusty cars down at the yeah. beach in air. Burnt cars. And yeah. I would suggest that, yes, the sea air does affect cars. Okay. So that's that's what Columbo had noticed when he left left um, yes, Kennecott's house. Yes, nothing to do with the tires at all. Nothing, nothing at all. The most obvious one. Um, so he's already started to uh, connect in terms of location uh, Lenore and Brimmer. Yes, he's got that beach connection there. He's effectively solved it at this point. Oh, he's now just yeah. trying to trying to find the, the, the try try to tie it all together and prove it. But he knows what's happened. Yeah, and he's prepared to do whatever it takes to mm. show that his theory, based on spurious evidence, yeah. is the truth. Yeah, um, and after he leaves, there's sort of one more thing. Kinda, kinda. Well, that's you know that that's what it was. It was a one more thing. Have you ever you know as um. He asks if you've ever been to 
Uh, Brimmer has ever been to the Kennicott's house? Yes. Yeah, and he says no. Well, he does. He says, yes, I saw you there. Is he not? No. Yeah, that was his main house. He's talking about the beach house. Right, okay, yes. Um, Columbo leaves and we see the first real signs of, I don't know, tension, worry, angst on, Br- on Brimmer's face. So he yes. now is a, under a bit of pressure. He's not a happy fellow. He's not point. happy. We go back to the golf shop. Yes. Late at night, or certainly in the dark. The Again, this is another scene that you're not convinced is... Ethical <laughs> query here, number okay. two. Yeah, okay. There's a real issue with Columbo's behaviour here. So the golf pro uh, is locking up, walks to his car, gets in his car, and Columbo is sitting there already waiting to question him. Smoking in his car as well. Yeah. Well, we'll let him away with the smoking one yeah. as a... Okay. You know, subject of his time. But, but I mean, I don't think it's too bad. At all. He hasn't, he hasn't broken into the car. It was probably, you know, it, was, it would have been left open. It's a bit creepy. A little bit creepy. I, I don't think it's proper procedure. Okay, but this again backs up what I'm saying. Had he wanted not to worry or scare, make sure everything was by the book, he would have walked into uh, the golf shop and said, "Listen, we need, we need a chat here." Yes. Yeah, he it's... is scaring him. He's putting pressure. He's making him edgy and jumpy in order that he talks. You agree now? Yes. Good. Um, and yeah. what happens? Uh, what happens is they have a chat, and he admits to an affair. Yes, and we also see that they're being watched by one of Brimmer's men. Well, before we see that, we Columbo asks if he thought he was being, you know, if anyone was suspicious, and he says, "Well, well they he, were having their affair." Yes. yes, and he says, "Well, yeah, actually, there was some guy that I think was following us." Yeah, he describes that guy. Yeah, Leo. We find well his name. We find out his name is Leo, and he's a marine type. <laughs> Here's a thing I haven't thought about before. We later on we discover that uh, Leo is Brimmer's top top man, yes. top agent. Yeah, top agent who was unable to spy covertly on <laughs> a golf pro. By, yeah, by by a, by a golf pro. Yeah. So maybe not that top, but anyway, that's a another little sort of plot hole, perhaps. Sure. Um. Archer's obviously concerned at this point because he's very well aware that he doesn't pro. have an alibi yes. for the time of the killing. And that's why he's been, you know, he didn't want to talk, he was lying. Yeah. He thinks, quite rightly so, that he would be a, he's having an affair with someone who's just died, been, been killed. Uh, he thinks, I'll be a, a prime suspect. Columbo puts his mind at ease and says, no, you don't wear a ring. Archer says, well, I could have taken the ring off. And Columbo says, not with that tan. Archer's a bit of a ladies' man, a bit of a playboy, golden golden bronzed Adonis type yeah so again you know I wouldn't like to be relying on that in court either way but Columbo seems pretty satisfied that not winning a ring and not having a ring tan tan line is enough uh, evidence to ignore him yeah essentially rule him out as a suspect here it's very difficult for me to look at this and say Columbus advanced this investigation in a professional way. He's not. I mean, like I say, he's very much on hunches here. And hunches are not a bad thing when you've got some direction, something to hang it on. And again, other episodes, I think, probably probably learned from this. Again, this is the first episode, you know, proper episode that's been written. Yeah. And I think they've probably looked at it and had the same, understood the same weaknesses themselves that the, it was far too uh, tenuous or far there was, there was nothing there yeah you know um, so we go to Brimmer's home next I believe yeah yes and we get a call from the employee or one of Brimmer's employees who's actually been following Colombo now and informs Brimmer that uh, this the golf pro has been doing a fair amount of talking to yeah you couldn't hear what was being said but he was, Archer was, he was chatting talking. So he, he must have assumed that he was telling him about the uh, affair. You would think so. Yep. Uh, and because of that, Bremer phones the home of Leo the Marine. Yes. And dispatches him so out, out of the picture. He, sign, he sends him on an assignment somewhere yeah. uh, to get rid of him so and that Columbo can't, can't speak to the him. The feeling you get is that it was just a made-up thing. He's just getting him out of the way. Yeah, of course. Well, when, I think he's, uh, we find out later on his wife says he brought his passport, so it's out of the country. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we go back to Brimmer's office, and Columbo is getting a, a tour off yes. the uh, off the office. 
there's some very proud chap showing off the guns, showing off the, the high tech computer system. Yeah, he loves working there. Oh, he loves it. He uh, talks about cars with telephones. Uh, Again, quite impressive for 1971. You know, I, I didn't see They a... seem to have what you would probably term all mod cons, yeah. I would say. They've got the latest of everything. They do. Uh, metal detector, which Columbo walks through, the chap thinks it's broken because Columbo's gun doesn't set it off. Yes. Now, again, question to you then. I mean, did you think that Columbo was a sort of, or perhaps you thought all cops, you know, would have been required to carry a I, I couldn't them? have said one way or the other okay. on that one. But I think you know it makes sense. You wouldn't expect Columbo to pull a gun, would you? Or would you? I don't think so. Yeah. But I, like I said, I've not seen enough to say that's definitely always going to be the case. Yep. But I don't think so. This employee who is giving Columbo the tour starts to talk uh, about other clients. Yes. And Brimmer walks out of his office at this point and quite rightly so, to be honest, is not happy with this chap blabbing about the work they're doing. Yeah, but rather than just simply chastising the guy, he erupts. He loses his temper. And Columbo knows, or already has mentioned to him, that the killer may be someone who loses their temper. So it's yeah, not, not yeah, very smart. Yeah. Columbo obviously had worked that out from all the evidence. <laughs> um, so Columbo and Brimmer are um, eating lunch. Brimmer tries to throw in some more yeah, dubious or falsified red herrings, red herrings yeah. about Two derelicts, you know, some two two homeless people. Uh, See the JFK theories, you know, the the three tramps at the side of the road. We won't go there, Ian. That's uh, that's for <laughs> that's for another podcast. Um, and Colombo again doing his sort of disarming, his bumbling, his you know, disrupting the flow of conversation by asking for uh, recipes to the, the the fish dish that they're eating. Yeah, Actually, I think it's just you know. This is closer to the Columbo that we recognised yes. from the previous episode. He's he, doing that disarming thing, he's being charming, he's being a little bit affable, a little bit self-deprecating, and I think this is when the character is at its best. Yep. Now, at this point, Columbo tells Brimmer what he knows, that Lenore was having an affair with the golf pro, and that they were being watched, um, and he suggests that it was possible that Kennicott hired an investigator to check up on her, uh, who then blackmails her. He's basically just laid yeah. out the entire... Essentially, Columbo has solved every aspect of this case. Yeah. And told Brimmer. I mean, because we know that you know, Brimmer's the investigator. This is brilliant. He, he tells Brimmer, here's exactly how it happened. Understand this. This is how it worked. And Brimmer still doesn't cotton on to the fact that he suspects him. Yeah. But Brimmer's forced, you know... Brimmer says it's a fairly fairly tenuous uh, reasons here you have for, for for putting this theory together, and Columbo says, well, "You think I should stop?" And he says, "No, if you if this is what you believe in, you have to see it through." Yeah, um, he can't see anything else, obviously. No, uh, but you know, effectively, he tells him, and it's yeah, it's an odd. It's you know, we're somewhat towards the end of the the show yet, and he's summed up exact. It's almost as if he watched the episode of Columbo himself. Yes, he's he's come back. Maybe it's uh, we've kind of slipped into quantum leap or something, and he's <laughs> he's come back to <laughs> to solve the crime that Brimmer got away with the first thing. So Brimmer, uh, he to get round this or to try and change the subject or yeah. trying to defuse or disarm Columbo's potential threat. Yeah, he offers him a job to come and work for Brimmer Associates or Brimmer Industries, whatever whatever they're called. Whatever yes. they're called, uh, and Columbo says he'll have a think about it. Uh, I think he says he'll be able to triple his current salary. He does. Well, that's an attractive option. I think lots of lots of us would like to triple our salary. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to triple my salary. Yeah, uh, but I don't think um, you know. There's never any sense that this is actually going to happen. Uh, you know, it's well, no, because I suspect he could hire him at that salary if he agreed to come. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's a sense that Colombo is prepared to do it. But he uses it to his Colombo uses this this to his advantage. He. Despite having already solved the case, obviously, yeah. Columbo uses this new information He's, well, to he, help himself. He does. He says he asks that if he did come and work for Brimmer, would he still be on the Kennicott case? Yes. And Brimmer thinks about it. Mm, probably not. We've got guys who can handle this. Bigger, you know, bigger ideas for you. Bigger plans for you, yeah. Columbo. Okay. So he says he'll, he'll think about it. He leaves the Brimmer's office, walks back out to the hallway, and has a chat with the chastised employee who was blabbing. Yes. 
he asks him again, uh, you know, is this typical of, of, of your, your boss? Yeah, and he gets told the guy's got a hair trigger. He basically flies into a rage at the yeah. slightest of provocations. And he also asks who the top the earner would be at the company. Well, yeah, this is in relation to the job offer. So he's yeah. talked about having received the job offer and then they start talking about salary. Yeah, and he says that the top chap earns 30k. Thirty thousand dollars. So he's bearing in mind that doing some basic math, uh, Bremer would triple his salary. So we're talking a maximum. Colombo is earning ten thousand dollars US dollars. Yeah, I don't know whether that's a good salary or not don't for know. that time, or what that would be in today's money. No, uh, what's that about? Well, back then that would be about five thousand pounds. I think yeah, in those days it was around about two dollars to yeah. the pound. Yeah, who knows? Maybe a. A reasonable salary. Possibly, possibly. Um, so, again, we find out that this chap is uh, the top man, the top employee is Leo, the, the Marine, who had been following. This is quite a tenuous one as well, because Colombo uses the information about the top salary to link it to the guy that was following the golf pro, essentially knowing that it would be the top guy on yeah. that job. There's no reason to think it would be the top no, guy on that job. Why would you send your top man to watch a golf pro? Especially as we find out, that he got spotted at the way. Find out the golf pro, yeah. This guy really is hopeless, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Uh, but hey, back in the seventies, you only had to, uh, yeah, you know, if you, if you could, yeah. I wouldn't mind the job of Brimmer if that was the standard. You know, not, yeah. If not all you have to do is just go there, and that's, yeah. that's great. But I think from a realistic portrayal of an investigation, this is a tenuous one that doesn't sit right for me at all. No. Neither does the next scene, I don't think. Oh, ethical violation number three. <laughs> we have, uh, we next see Colombo pushing a young boy on a swing in a He's playground. literally seconds away from pulling a wee paper bag of sweets out of his pocket. Yeah, he's wearing a dirty raincoat and he's interacting with a, a young boy in a playground. Not, even back in the 70s, that couldn't have been... And thankfully, the other characters agree and he yeah. is pulled up for this. Yeah, the, the, the mother comes across and inquires quite... Uh, forcefully about what he's doing with her uh, with her son. Yes, and then similar, almost mirroring the opening uh, moments of Columbus' participation, he says, I'm a policeman, and yeah. everything's okay. Everyone trusts a cop. There's but... no <laughs> people in the police force who would be doing anything untoward. But this scene is just so that we can find out that this is uh, Leo the Marine's uh, wife. Yeah, she had answered the phone previously, we've seen her, so we know the connection between those two. Yeah. And this is Colombo finding out that Leo is not going to be any use to him. He's not here. He's been sent away. Yep. We next move on to the scene where there's the first... Well, I was going to say the first breakthrough, but I suppose it's the first breakthrough only in the sense that there's a potential piece of evidence. Yeah, I mean, we can't really say a breakthrough because, as we've already noted, Colombo solved this crime just before it was committed. So he has an epiphany here. Yeah. Maybe this is a way I can prove it. Okay, but it's not a breakthrough in terms of working out what happened. No, we're in the. Uh, it's a callback to the the scene where we find out his driving license is due to expire. Yes, this was a yeah. reference to something that happened. So we're in the, the we're, we're in the equivalent of I don't know DVLA, whatever that is in the states. Yeah, and licensing like, bureau of some kind, uh, of course. And there is a lady taking doing some sort of eye test. Yeah, she's covering one eye and reading out letters. And at this point, I <laughs> thought, ah, they're going to bring in the glass eye thing here. They're going to reference it, yeah. Yeah, but no, no. But we, as you say, Colombo has some sort of epiphany, some sort of revelation, awareness that he had seen a picture of Lenore wearing glasses, but when the body was found, there were no uh, glasses on her. Correct. So he then goes to Kennicott's house and speaks to Mr. Kennicott. He does. She says she started wearing contact lenses. He says she started wearing contact lenses yep. and that was why she wouldn't be wearing glasses. Okay. He checks her handbag and there's an empty contact lens case yes so what happens <laughs> he then being very vague <laughs> recruits mr kennicott and he gets given a blank check now whether that means a financial check or just uh i think it's a metaphorical emotional or metaphorical yeah, I, I think that situation. means do what you need to do do what you need to do he gets the go ahead for mr kennicott to take an extreme step He's and not just an extreme step in a legitimate investigation, but in what is essentially, we're going to find out, an entrapment scheme. 
I'm not too sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, again, the paperwork, it doesn't matter if the guy, is, if, if the husband is fairly rich and well off. Yeah. I'm not sure if the, uh, the, uh, the widow uh, or the widower is entitled to sign off paperwork to have a, a body exhumed. I think that has to go through proper, you know, must be lots red of... tape, must be red tape. Masses off it. You can't pull bodies out of the ground because, you know, someone says so, the husband said so. But they do. But they do. And, and okay, so yeah. the plan here is, or the thinking here is that uh, if there are no, uh, if the body has doesn't have the contact lenses on it, yeah, the very again tenuous yeah. theory that Columbo proposes is in the violence of the fatal blow being struck, a contact lens could have been or two, or two could have been shaken loose from her eyes and fallen onto the ground, and may well yeah, so be somewhere related. That somebody that can identify uh, the, 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 uh, the criminal. Yes, it could be a vital piece of evidence pointing out this. Because yeah. the conclusion they made was she was not killed where she was found. Yes. Uh, we, the, someone has been, one of the Brimmer's agents has been following Colombo and telephones Brimmer to let him know that uh, Kennicott and Colombo are at the cemetery about to exhume the body. Yes, and if Colombo didn't know he was being followed before, he'd knows when <laughs> Brimmer he, shows up without having been told yeah, this he, was happening. He, he shows up. Um, and Brimmer, but he doesn't show up in his own car. No? Ah, now that's a that's very a critical important point. point. So, Brimmer's told that Columbo uh, and Kennicott are at the cemetery. So he goes down to his the car park to try and get his own car to drive there. He does. And one of the attendants or whoever um, in the garage tells him that his car doesn't start, isn't, isn't working. Yeah. So he takes a pool car. Yeah, and he asks for his car to get fixed, fixed as a matter of urgency. Which would then go to the, the garage. Yes. Uh, Brimmer turns up at the cemetery and is not very helpful. Columbo explains what his, you know, the, the long shot of finding the lens. Yeah, this is where he, he abandons all attempts at subtlety and essentially says, um, I'm going to hunt for this contact lens, here's the story, the body's up, there's one missing, if only the killer knew. We, oh, that is a, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. What he says was, you know, if there, the one, one thing that I would love, I'm paraphrasing here, is that um, if the killer also knew what we were doing, that, that there is a lens missing somewhere. That doesn't, yes. it doesn't make sense. If the killer was aware of that, they would simply have a chance of finding it and removing it. Yeah, yeah. He's essentially saying the killer exposing himself by trying to deal with this piece of evidence is better than finding the piece of evidence. Yeah, it's almost as if he's saying if the killer was aware of that, of this, uh, we would be able to finish according to the script. Yeah, I mean, Columbo obviously in this episode doesn't seem one for evidence much at all. So you can understand that. Uh, and, and as we later find out, he isn't really looking for this contact lens anyway. But the way it's presented here is essentially, um, you know, it says, it's very much a sledgehammer technique here. He's going to Brimmer, <laughs> I know you did it! <laughs> Wake up! <laughs> so the, the seed has been planted with a, with a spade. Yes. Uh, and the next scene is in Brimmer's home. Yes. He is scrabbling around on his uh, thick... He's rolled up. He's in the carpet, but the carpet's rolled yeah. up well, a he's bit. He's looking underneath it. Th- this is something I'd mentioned to you earlier, um, Ian. Um, the broken table. The you broken were talking table, about the broken yeah. Table. So we accept that it's hard to find, or this contact lens could be a fell out on the floor or um, in, in the rug. A table shattered. Now, I break glasses in the house all the time. And they're an absolute pain to try and clean up. There are bits everywhere. Yeah. They shatter all over the place. A table shattering like that, there'd be glass everywhere. That'd be more of a clue than the lens itself. Yeah. Um, there, there's no way there'd be no glass here. Yeah, and glass, which nowadays would have DNA on it, but obviously we're not, not introduced to not DNA in a Colombo context. Anyway, Brimmer's on his hands and knees. He's trying to find this, looking for this lens. Unsuccessfully. Unsuccessfully. The door goes and Columbo's there. Yes. Under the guise of informing him that he sadly has to decline the offer of employment. 
because he wants to stay in the Kinnikut case. He's almost solved it. Yeah, he does say that. And again, it's a, it's a shift in relationship from the earlier, the, the scenes they played together themselves, where Brimmer was certainly looking to be the authority figure, very uh, composed, very professional. He asks Columbo, uh, well, Columbo, yeah, says, pretty much solved. I know what's going on. Brimmer says, are you going to tell me? He says, you'll be the first to know. He doesn't say, oh, well, tell me just now. We're working together here <laughs> yeah. as, a, as a team. He says, okay, obviously just trying to get rid of Columbo so he can continue with his yeah, search. Yeah, at this point, his focus is not where it was. It's not. Um, so he obviously finds nothing in the, the carpet or the, the floor of his, of his home. There. So what he does is he goes to... He thinks it oh, must be in the trunk of the car. Yeah, which Columbo must have magically worked out was used to transport the body. Perhaps he did look at the tire, tire tracks and just never gets mentioned. Perhaps. Or, I mean, if we assume that the body was moved, you would assume that it would be the most obvious yeah. mode of transport. He wasn't going to take her on the uh, the bus. Sure. Okay. So he breaks into the garage of where this, his car is being repaired. And it's quite strange. He gets inside the boot, or the trunk. He climbs into the, the climb, boot. Yeah. Trunk. Okay. This is America. Well, yeah. we're not, but... That's okay. He gets in the boot slash trunk. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, finds uh, a lens. Yes, there's a contact lens there, and... Amazingly enough. Yeah. Think He must think to himself, oh, nice. That's a relief. A big relief. And just as he picks it up and looks at it, Lots of headlights, car headlights go on, and we see Columbo, Kennicutt, and some other random policemen yeah. uh, approach uh, Brimmer. Yes. And again, we should say police entirely competent in this scene. Very. Well, I'm not sure if generally you allow the murder, the uh, the the husband of the victim to turn up at arrest scenes and things like that. I'm not it's sure. It's almost like it's more important to Columbo that the husband knows who did it then yeah. that he's got a conviction well well, actually because that that may be true it may well be that Columbo is aware of any bad publicity so even if they don't get a conviction if Kennicott knows who that Columbo found the killer yeah. he's unlikely, unlikely to uh, give any bad PR in his, his media in fact perhaps the opposite sure okay. so uh, they, they all approach Brimmer <laughs> yes what happens? Essentially, Brimmer tries to hide the contact lens in a packet of cigarettes so that it was slight of hand. Columbo, of course, knew before he did it that he was going to do this and is ready for him. He has the police officer nearest to him grab the arm. Brimmer. Grab, grab his hand, I think they say. He, yeah, Columbo, this is the first time we can mm-hmm. really remember Columbo yelling. He yells, grab his arm, or grab his hand. And they do. They look in the packet. Contact lens is there. And Brimmer... Confesses. Yeah. Now, in fairness, I think we slightly perhaps disagree on this. I think the okay how they how they arrived there is is where we disagree. But I think the fact that he was searching in that trunk for a contact lens is fairly fairly reasonable evidence or proof that he. Yeah. You know, for me, this is number four in the list of um, ethical dubious ethically mm-hmm. dubious activities conducted yeah. by Colombo. He essentially. And we're about to find out that the exhumed body had two contact lenses. So, not only has he planted false evidence there in the boot of the car, and okay, fair enough, he's not going to use it as evidence, so it's not something that's going to come up at trial, but having exhumed a body, he has now used significant resources to set up a trap. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's not ethically sound. Yeah, I see, I don't know... I don't have the same problem. Um, it, what, it said before that it's not like he has told some innocent person that there's a million pounds sitting in a, a million dollars sitting in a bag somewhere and encouraged them to go and, and steal this. If he wasn't guilty of the crime in the first place, this would not be an attractive proposition anyway. So honey trap is generally when there's an innocent person who is encouraged. Uh, entrapment is an innocent per Again, this is my understanding an entirely innocent person encouraged to commit a crime. This isn't the case. This is a, a, a case. this is a guilty person being encouraged to try and cover up a crime. Yeah, but what he has done is induced through deception someone to take an action that they would not otherwise have taken that leads 
to them doing something incriminating. Okay. Well, I think as we discussed last week, and you know, this Colombo isn't concerned with what happens next. With oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he's not concerned with we as the show is not concerned with the the, the you know people getting let off the technicalities or all that sort of stuff. stuff. He's fo- he's found his man. In fact, the guys, the chap has uh, Bremer has admitted to it. Admitted to it in front of the uh, the victim's uh, husband. Um, so that's it. All wrapped Job well up. Done. Job everyone's well done. Happy. I think everyone's happy. They have a confession in front of witnesses. Um, Colombo will be chalking that one off. Yep. He'll have a bourbon and drive home. So you've watched two episodes now of Colombo. What's, what, what, what's your thoughts? I mean, I think you've said through this as well. You. You, you know, this was a you, you find this a or you found this a, a slightly weaker episode. I did, and I can understand why they would have led with the, the other one, even if it was made second. It's a stronger episode, it's stronger performances, and it was a better story for me. Okay, this one still was watchable. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't something that I would say is the best television I've ever seen. It wasn't, like I said, as good as the previous episode. It wasn't horrific. It wasn't something that I would say, I'm never watching that again. It's terrible. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. It's, uh, it certainly is a weaker episode in terms of the... Well, I mean, it does depend how you how you judge an episode. If you're looking at it purely from the getting te- things technically right, you know, in terms of the uh, police procedural. Yeah. But uh, also, the problem I had with this, it doesn't even make sense. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it wasn't so much that there are some technical things. Even the ethical things, mm-hmm. that's fair enough. We can talk about this. That's great. That's entertaining. It was more the Columbo solving the crime without any reason to have been able to do that and then everything else just kind of following on from that. So all the events from the final two-thirds of the episode are following on from Columbo solving the crime in his head, Mm -hmm. which wasn't, for me, possible. All he could possibly do is have a hunch. And the amount of resources that were then dedicated to proving or disproving that hunch yeah, it's not right. I mean, if he, I actually would have found it more entertaining if he'd had the wrong hunch and committed all this resource, and then oh, he was completely wrong. Okay, the fact that he, you know, through two episodes, Columbo has been presented as infallible to an extent. Although we did have the twist at the end of the first episode, where the theory that the whole thing was based on actually was wrong. Yeah. Um, but there seems to me to be too much leading from belief and hunches mm-hmm. rather than from facts and evidence, which you would think would be more important if the story is this guy's a great investigator. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I, I agree with you. And as I said before, it's you know it's, what I'm trying to do is well, I'm being forced to view this through someone else's eyes. And of all, you know, all the times I've watched this, you know, on a lazy Sunday afternoon, haven't considered it quite as as deeply as this, and I will grant you, yeah, that I, I have found that there are you know weaknesses in uh, in this particular episode as as you've just eloquently uh, described. But I mean, to me, it's still it's still a very watchable episode, not a bad episode, weaker than the first. Yeah. Um, but like I say, as was the first one written, second one broadcast, the show needs. We will need to take a little bit of time to sort of bed in to understand itself and to get a, a proper structure formula and and they'll learn themselves as, as they sure. go. Sure, and, and I think to an extent more average episodes make the good ones stand out. Yeah. So, although you don't want to make an average episode, the fact that you have them isn't necessarily no. hugely detrimental. Okay. I think that's about us for this week then. Um, what do we want to say here? Uh, I think we should let folk know what's coming up next week. Before we do that, just a reminder of the trivia question. Yes. How many episodes uh, of a Columbo oh, of, of a Columbo program uh, or show has Robert Culp appeared in? Yeah, Robert Culp's Columbo appearances. Yes. Um, how can people get in touch? There's two ways, principally through Twitter at Columbo Podcast or visiting. ColumboPodcast.com where they can comment on the show notes. Okay. Um, next week, what are we watching? Do you know? Do you want me to tell Episode you? Episode 3. I don't Episode know the title. Episode 3. Dead Weight. Dead Weight. That's next week. There's an allusion to death there, so I'm assuming it could be another killing. Do you think so? Well, mm-hmm. I'm not going to go out on a limb at this stage. 
You shouldn't. But it certainly is a possibility. Okay. So thanks again for listening to the show. Hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. And we shall see you guys next week. Cheerio. Bye-bye. been listening to the Colombo podcast from Herd Yet Media.